So uh, welcome Great. to this seminar, which is actually four seminars uh, merge into one. So it's the research seminar at the Institute for Future S uh, Studies, and it's also the um, uh, s uh, seminar for the so we have jointly with the Center for Population Level Bioethics at Rutgers University, New Jersey, and it's also part of a workshop on sustainability, which is part of a project on sustainable populations. And it's also part of the big interdisciplinary uh, project on climate ethics. So, Mike, I'm not sure whether you've ever been performing to four seminars at the same time. This might be the, the first time you're doing that. So, uh, I'm very uh, pleased to introduce to you um, Mike Utsuka. He's a professor of philosophy. Uh, in transition, I guess, I should say, uh, from London School of Economics uh, to Rutgers University. He got his PhD in philosophy, politics from Oxford uh, and supervision Jerry Cohen. And his research interests are very wide indeed. Uh, it's uh, theoretical and practical and in various combinations. But I guess one focus has been on the on value and the metaphysics of risks and chances of benefits, um, but also a work on, um, so we'll see today, on risk pooling and pensions, insurance. Property ownership is another very important topic Mike has been working a lot on, and also in relation to actually left libertarianism is one, one of the most uh, important contributors to that kind of libertarianism. Uh, and also various issues concerning egalitarianism or prioritarianism and separateness of persons. It's quite a wide set of very interesting topics. And of course, he's published in uh, very prestigious journals and also published books. And I think, if I'm not wrong, this particular talk will be a chapter three, it looks like. And in a forthcoming book, an uh, OUP book, uh, which is um, entitled How to Pool Risks Across Generations, The Case for Collective Pensions. And that's, in fact, the title of the talk as well. So, very welcome. Right, thank you very much. It's really, really nice to, to be here. Um, and I think without further ado, I'll just launch into the lecture. So, it, um, this is, the, yes, the third chapter of a book, um, How to Pull Risks Across Generations, The Case for Collective Pensions. And this chapter is the case for an unfunded pay-as-you-go pension. Um, now, the earlier chapters of the book were devoted entirely to consideration of pensions that are funded. And so just, just a little bit about the contrast I'm drawing between a funded and an unfunded pension. So a funded pension is one in which your pension is drawn from the realization of returns on the investments of contributions into a pension fund that typically both you and your employer have made during your working life. Now, this fund might be held just by you as an individual, as in the case of traditional individual defined contribution pension pots, or the fund might be held collectively with others with whom one pools risk. Now, a funded occupational defined benefit pension scheme involves collective funding. Okay. Now, in the case of a funded pension, investment risk poses perhaps the greatest challenge. Now, especially in recent years, with government bond yields as low as they are, a low-risk option of investment in long-dated inflation-linked government bonds that are thought to match the pension's liability has become prohibitively expensive. Now, in order, however, to reap the premium of higher expected returns on equities and property, one must contend with the risk that these returns will fall well short of the expectation if you avoid the risk-free uh, asset. Now, in light of these problems with, to which investment risk gives rise, I think it'd be worthwhile to consider the merits and promise of another form of pension provision, which also raises a number of interesting theoretical issues. Now, this is a form of pensions provision which doesn't involve the investment of contributions which have been deposited into a pension fund. And that's why in this particular talk, what I'm gonna do is consider the case for pensions that are provided on an unfunded, so-called pay-as-you-go, P-A-Y-G basis. 
Now, what is a pay-as-you-go pension involved? Now, with a pay-as-you-go pension scheme, money is transferred from those who are currently working to pay the pensions of those who are currently retired. And so like uh, many other state pensions, those with which I'm most familiar in the US and the UK are pay-as-you-go. Now, so rather than drawing from a pension fund consisting of a portfolio of financial assets, in the US and the UK and many other countries, state pensions are paid out of annual tax revenues. The pension that one is entitled to in retirement, however, is based on, even though not funded by, the contributions one has made during one's working life in the form of a payroll tax. Now, in some countries, neither eligibility for a basic pay-as-you-go state pension nor its level is conditional on contributions of portions of one's earnings during one's working life. Now, these arrangements are, are more akin to other forms of welfare spending involving redistributive transfers funded solely by taxation. Now, there remains a non-contributory contributory residence requirement for eligibility, as in the case of other forms of welfare spending. Now, in some cases, there's merely a threshold residency requirement. All who've lived for a given number of years if meet that threshold are eligible to the same degree for the state pension. Now, in the Netherlands, this is a bit of a special case, the residency requirement, there's no contribution requirement, just a residency requirement, but it's scalar rather than a threshold. The level of the basic state pension to which one is entitled increases on the basis of the number of years that one has been a resident. Now, it's also the case that many public sector occupational pensions are pay-as-you-go. So in the United Kingdom, uh, the National Health Service pension, civil servant pension, pensions for the armed forces and for teachers, they're all provided on an unfunded pay-as-you-go basis. Now, in the case of these public sector schemes, there are employee and employer contributions sort of along the lines of private occupational pension schemes, but these contributions go into the coffers of the UK Treasury rather than being invested into a portfolio of assets that are held in a fund. And then pensions in payment come out of the treasury's coffers as well. Now, the case for an unfunded pay as you go, as opposed to a funded pension is strong, I think, and strongest perhaps when there are compelling grounds to redistribute income from those who've had the good fortune to be higher earners to those who suffer the misfortune of lower earnings when such redistribution cannot be achieved by means of the risk pooling of the earnings of different people that's in the actual ex ante self interest of all who enter the pool. So, in other words, unfunded pay as you go is justified when we require the services of, of Robin Hood and not just the insurance of a mutual association. Like a number, uh, see, I'm just seeing, the, uh, did, did someone just put a um, comment in the chat? Um, Oops, I need just to, instructions I, for the audience. Okay, sorry, I, I just um, got thrown off. Now I need to figure out how to get the little. I think I did this in the past, where, where the where the where the window is um, now too big. Um, okay, now if, oh, one sec. If if I um I oh yeah now now, now I remember yeah now, now you're sorry sorry <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay, so um, so in other words. Unfunded pay as you go is just why when we require the services of Robin Hood, not just the insurance of a mutual association. So, like another of other unfunded pay as you go state pensions, the UK state pension is in fact highly redistributed, redistributed from higher to lower earners. The amount that one contributes is proportional to one's income up to an income ceiling, but the amount of one's annual pension in retirement is proportional simply to the number of years one has worked and made mandatory contributions on income that exceeds a very low amount. Hence, money is transferred from high earners to low earners with the goal of relieving poverty in old age in what has come to be known as the beverage as opposed to the Bismarck approach to state pensions where Bismarck approach is more earnings sensitive. The pension you get is more earnings sensitive. Now, the sort of beverage approach where everyone who contributes a certain number of years gets the same pension would probably not be in the actual ex ante self-interest of each to adopt at the point at which one leaves full-time education and begins one's working career. 
And this is because even at that early point, each person upon graduating, say, from university, has a fairly good idea of whether his or her expected earnings will be high or low. And it would probably not, therefore, be in the rational self-interest of those who expect to be higher earners to choose a state pension along sort of beverage UK lines. I think one would need to impose a, th impose a thicker hypothetical veil, which deprives people of knowledge of their talents and therefore their earning potential in order to render it in the rational self-interest of each to choose such a redistributive state pension at the beginning of his adult life. Now, a Dworkinian luck egalitarian would offer just such a justification based on hypothetical insurance choices for an unfunded redistributive pay-as-you-go state pension, which Dworkin himself does. Now, I shall now turn to the question of whether there's a reciprocity-based justification as opposed to an egalitarian, like egalitarian justification for an unfunded pay-as-you-go pension, uh, such as, uh, say, the American or the UK state pension. Now, in particular, the question I want to ask is, might such an arrangement provide a realization of reciprocity in the Rawlsian sense of fair terms of social cooperation for mutual advantage, which he situates as follows, between altruistic impartiality and mere mutual advantage. So Rawls says, the idea of reciprocity lies between the idea of impartiality, which is altruistic, being moved by the general good, and the idea of mutual advantage, understood as everyone's being advantaged with respect to each person's present or expected future situation as things are. And he says, as understood in justice as fairness, reciprocity, by contrast, is a relation between citizens expressed by principles of justice that regulate a social world in which everyone benefits, judged with respect to an appropriate benchmark of equality defined with respect to that world. Now, the fact that people would prudently select a redistributive pay-as-you-go state pension from behind a hypothetical veil of ignorance is, I think, insufficient to establish that embodies the idea of reciprocity. I'll just briefly mention why. Um, there are the following reasons why it's hard to interpret Rawlsian self-interested choice behind the veil of ignorance as involving reciprocity, in this sense I've just introduced. So first, this doesn't involve an agreement or even tit-for-tat interaction between different individuals. Rather, it involves a self-interested choice of a single individual, this is the point Gene Hampton made decades ago. Second, the choice behind the Rawlsian veil is self-interested only in, on the hypothetical assumption that the individual might turn out to be any member of society. And just to briefly elaborate a bit on this second point, which is familiar to just about everyone, the choice is not in everyone's actual self-interest. Moreover, it's in everyone's ex-ante self-interest only by virtue of the imposition of a veil that renders one self ignorant of one's fate. Now, Rawls maintains that his original position models what he calls a fair system of cooperation for mutual advantage between free and equal persons. Now, on account of the impartiality of the choice that the veil ensures among symmetrically situated individuals, what would be chosen behind the veil might constitute a fair system of cooperation among equals, but it's not plausibly thought to be to the mutual advantage of the parties, at least their actual mutual advantage. So I think such choice behind the veil might be better understood as modeling impartial altruism rather than reciprocity. Um, and we shouldn't be misled by Rawls's modeling involving self-interested choice into thinking that the terms of cooperation chosen in the original position are to the mutual advantage of each. So what I want to do now is see whether we can provide an account of the reciprocity of a pay-as-you-go pension scheme which doesn't require the hypothetical imposition of a veil in order to demonstrate the mutual, mutually advantageous nature of the scheme. So worker contributions that pay for the pensions of those in retirement in an unfunded pay-as-you-go scheme are not in return for benefits that those in retirement confer upon this group of workers. And I'm here setting to one side the possibility that we might say, look, these worker contributions are to be conceived as in return 
for the taxes that pensioners paid when they were workers for the education, say, of workers when they were children. That's an interesting reciprocity-based justification of even pay-as-you-go pensions as part of a greater system of taxation, which is reciprocal. But I, I set that suggestion to one side. If we just look at what's happening in a pay-as-you-go pension scheme without embedding it in this greater system of taxation and transfer, what we have is something that differs from a typical bi-directional form of reciprocity in which parties exchange benefits with one another. I think one might try, however, to draw an analogy between pay-as-you-go and other intergenerational arrangements, where these other intergenerational arrangements are plausibly characterized as reciprocal, even though they're unidirectional in nature, rather than involving more familiar bi-directional exchanges of reciprocity. In fact, Rawls's just savings might, I think, provide such an analogy. So Rawls maintains that since generations are spread out in time and actual economic benefits flow only in one direction, there's no way for later generations to help the situation of the least fortunate earlier generation, at least when these generations are non-overlapping. Each generation therefore benefits the next generation by saving for it, but not in exchange for any uh, benefit that the next generation confers on it. Now, in spite of its unidirectional nature, I think a case can be made that Rawls's just savings principle is grounded in a principle of reciprocity involving this notion of fair return to a party other than the party from which one has received a benefit. So rather any given generation is obliged to benefit the next generation in return for a benefit that it has received from the previous generation. Now, Rawls's own argument for his just savings principle involves an appeal to a principle of universalizability rather than actually reciprocity. So Rawls says, from behind the veil, we choose a savings principle for our own unknown generation on the assumption that all previous and future generations adopt the same principle. It's universalizable. And then he says the correct principle is that which the members of any generation, and so all generations, would adopt as the one their generation is to follow, and as the principle they would want preceding generations to have followed and later generations to follow, no matter how far back or forward in time. Now, among the requirements of this principle are that each generation saves for the next at least as much as the previous generation save for it. Now, an alternative to this appeal to universalizability is a defense of Rawls's just savings principle by means of an appeal to something like the principle of fairness, according to which one has an obligation to contribute to a cooperative scheme that's triggered by the benefits one has received from that scheme. Now, a just savings principle might be conceived as a form of cooperation insofar as such um, uh, a scheme is to the mutual advantage of each. And along these lines, Rawls writes the following. He says, is, if all generations are to gain, except perhaps the earlier ones, and that that exception is gonna take on some significance later, if all generations are to gain, except perhaps the earlier ones, the parties must agree to a savings principle that ensures that each generation receives its due from its predecessor and does its fair share for those to come. And so perhaps the charge of free riding off of the efforts of others that's integral to the principle of fairness can be invoked to condemn those who benefit from the savings of their ancestors without in turn passing on comparable savings to their descendants. Now, although this wouldn't involve an appeal to reciprocity in the ordinary sense involving bi-directional exchanges, it might be thought to involve a version of reciprocity more widely understood. Now, in a manner analogous to that of an unfunded pay-as-you-go pension scheme, but at the level of individual members of a family across overlapping generations, Ken Binmore has argued that conformity to a norm of benefiting one's elders might be a mutually advantageous Nash equilibrium which is to say an equilibrium in which each does better for himself by conforming rather than defecting given the choices of others. So Binmore asks us to consider the following case to illustrate this possibility. He says, it's a very simple case. 
Imagine a world in which only a mother and a daughter are alive at any time. Each player lives for two periods. The first period is her youth and the second her old age. In her youth, a player bakes two large loaves of bread. She then gives birth to a daughter and immediately grows old. Old players are too feeble to work and so they produce nothing. Now one equilibrium requires each player to consume both of her loaves in her bread in her youth. Everyone will then have to endure a miserable old age when they'll be very hungry, having more or less digested both of their loaves in their youth. But in this case, everyone will be optimizing given the choices of others. So that's one Nash equilibrium. But all players would prefer something else, namely to consume one loaf from their youth and one loaf from their old age. But this fair outcome can only be achieved if the daughters all give one of their two loaves to their mothers because bread perishes in this example if it's not consumed when baked. Now, a world in which each conforms to a norm of sharing with one's elder is better for each than a world in which nobody conforms, but rather each person hoards benefits for herself rather than giving anything to anyone else. And Bidmore offers the following explanation of how conformity to a norm of sharing might emerge. So he says, he notes, Mothers can't retaliate um, if daughters are selfish, but the fair outcome can nevertheless be sustained as an equilibrium. In this fair equilibrium, a conformist is a player who gives her mother a loaf if and only if her mother was a conformist in her youth. Conformists therefore reward other conformists and punish non-conformists. And he says, to see why a daughter gives her mother a loaf, Suppose that Alice, Beatrice, and Carol are mother, daughter, and granddaughter. If Beatrice neglects Alice, then she becomes a non-conformist. Carol therefore punishes Beatrice to avoid becoming a non-conformist herself. If not, she'll be punished by her daughter and so on. If the firstborn player is deemed to be a conformist, that's a stipulation, even though she didn't obviously benefit someone before her, if the firstborn player is deemed to be a conformist, it's therefore a perfect equilibrium for everyone to be a conformist. Now, Joseph Heath employs a similar model to try to show that unfunded pay-as-you-go pension schemes embody a form of indirect reciprocity involving indirect intergenerational cooperation where benefits flow in one direction only. Workers of one generation pay for the pensions of those in retirement, at that time, in return for having their pensions paid by the next generation of workers when they're retired. And he describes the motivation to contribute to an unfunded pay-as-you-go university pension in the following terms. He says, every month a fairly large portion, over 5% of my salary, is deducted from my paycheck and essentially handed over to one of my emeritus colleagues. At the end of the year, I'm sent a letter telling me what my own anticipated monthly pension will be based on my current salary and accumulated years of service. But he says, but this is nothing more than a promise and a weak one at that. It's hostage to all the vicissitudes of employer-employee bargaining over the next 20 years. So why do I agree to this? Is it because I'm confident? So it, it is because I'm confident that when I'm older and retired, there will be a new generation of young professors who are willing to do the same thing for me that I'm currently doing for my emeritus colleagues. But why should I expect the next generation, he asks, to be willing to hand over 5% of their salary to me? Certainly not out of gratitude for the fact that I'm doing so now to the benefit of my older colleagues. He says it's because I expect them to expect that they will someday have younger colleagues who will do the same for them. That is, that the chain of cooperation will continue on into the future unbroken or that the pension scheme will remain, as I say, a going concern. Now, unlike Binmore's case, in which one's contribution is directed towards a single individual to whom one has special ties, one's mother, workers' pension contributions are anonymously spread out among a group of strangers. The choice of individuals to make contributions to a large anonymous scheme can't, I think, readily be explained as a socially enforced norm that gives rise to a Nash equilibrium. Rather, there's a need for enforcement mechanisms, which ultimately involve the threat of state-imposed penalties. Now, in the case of employer-based pay-as-you-go pensions, 
members don't actually voluntarily pay pensions contributions into their employer scheme on the understanding that if they do, then the next generation of workers will voluntarily do so as well in accordance to a norm conformity to which is in Nash equilibrium. Rather, what underpins such a pension scheme is a standard bilaterally reciprocal and legally enforceable contract between the members of a given generation and the institution that promises them a pension in return for their contribution, where this institution is the state in the case of public sector pensions. A pay-as-you-go defined benefit private occupational pension would also involve a promise by the employer. Moreover, employer-based pay-as-you-go pensions could not be sustained in the absence of such an enforceable promise that the employer extends to workers. Now, in the case of a state pension, state pay-as-you-go pension, contributions are explained by the fact that the state makes them mandatory uh, in a manner that's backed up by threat of punishment. The state could not rely on individuals voluntarily making contributions in accordance with the norm that gives rise to a Nash equilibrium any more than they can rely on the voluntary payment of other taxes. Now, if a voluntary norm in Nash equilibrium plays any role in explaining how state pensions are sustained, like Social Security or the UK state pension, are sustained over time, it's going to need to be at the collective level of the demos rather than at the level of individuals. State pensions contributions are mandatory. But note that states tend to provide themselves with a fair amount of discretion in the pensions they end up paying people in retirement. Unlike the contract between employer and employee for an occupational pension, the state pension is not underpinned by a bilateral reciprocal contract between the state and the individual in which the state literally legally promises each individual a given level of pension in exchange for its contributions. Rather, the state pension can and often is altered at democratic will. The fact, however, that states continue at the collective level to voluntarily pay pensions might be explained by the following Nash equilibrium at the level of this collective. Voters democratically choose to continue to make contributions to pay for the pensions of those in retirement, not just because the elderly vote in disproportionate numbers, but because today's workers realize that if they vote to stop making contributions to the pensions of those in retirement, then the next generation of workers will vote against making contributions towards their own retirement. Now, Assuming that the members of the different generations are equally situated, the mutually advantageous Nash equilibrium might be described as an instance of the type of Rawlsian reciprocity that I introduced a few slides ago. One which involves a relation between citizens, as quoting from Rawls, um, as I did a moment ago, a relation between citizens expressed by principles of justice that regulate a social world in which everyone benefits, judged with respect to an appropriate benchmark of equality. Now, as we'll see in a moment, however, the assumption that the members of the different generations are equally situated is unsound. The first generation is actually privileged over others, and hence we don't have the requisite benchmark of equality. Now, assuming that Binmore's scenario includes an original Eve who receives a loaf from her daughter, even though she has no mother to whom to provide a loaf, not all parties are equally situated in Binmore's case either, since Eve will enjoy a windfall relative to the others. And that's why, you know, Binmore has to introduce this wrinkle that we just assume that Eve is a cooperator. Um, now, there's this problem of unfairness that I want to talk about now with an unfunded pay-as-you-go pension. Unfunded pay-as-you-go state pensions involve the prima facie unfairness of the first generations getting a free ride since the first generation made few, if any, contributions into the system. So the first American, for example, to receive a monthly Social Security check had paid only $24.75 in contributions over a period of three years when she received her first monthly check of $22.54 at the age of 65 in 1940. And she ultimately collected a total of $22,888.92 $22, 
during the ensuing 35 years leading up to her death at the age of 100. Now, in theory, we could construct an almost entirely unfunded pay-as-you-go state pension in which the first generation to receive a pension in retirement makes contributions into the scheme throughout their working lives. Now, unlike a normal pay-as-you-go scheme, these contributions would not go towards any pensions in payment at the time, since by hypothesis there would be none. If these contributions of the first generation were instead invested, ring-fenced, and held in reserve for the payment of their own future pensions, and the same arrangement was applied to all subsequent generations, and basically we would have transformed the arrangement into a funded pension system. But suppose, however, that the pensions contributions of the first generation were instead invested, ring-fenced, and held in reserve to pay the pensions for the retirement of the final generation of contributors during their working lives in the event of eventual scheme closure. In this case, all generations would be equally situated insofar as each generation which receives a pension would also make contributions that pay for the pensions of another generation. Now here, each generation would pay the pensions of the previous generation in typical unfunded pay-as-you-go fashion, except for the first generation whose contributions would loop forward to the final generation. And, and that's what explains the, um, the, 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 the image at the beginning of uh, this lecture, the sort of looping forward and then back. Now, apart from the fact that the first generation's um, contributions would be held and invested in a fund for the last generation, this would be an unfunded pay-as-you-go realization of an indirect form of Rawlsian reciprocity. Reciprocity obtains since each generation both contributes to another generation's pension and receives contributions for its own pension from another generation. This looping arrangement would incidentally also provide a solution to a problem of backward induction that uh, Gustav and others have pressed against pay-as-you-go schemes when it's known that they will eventually close and the date of closure is also known. So in a nutshell, the problem of backward induction for pay-as-you-go pensions is as follows. If there's a known future date at which a pay-as-you-go pension scheme will close with no further payments of pensions, the generation that knows they'll retire at or near the date of closure will refuse to contribute during their working lives to the pensions of the previous generation, but then knowing that they too will not receive a pension, that previous generation will refuse to contribute to the pensions of the generation before then, and so forth. Now, this sort of looping forward pension scheme is, I think, merely an interesting theoretical possibility. No actually existing pay-as-you-go state pension scheme has ever involved such a looping forward arrangement, nor, I think, is its future implementation likely. This merely theoretically interesting possibility does, however, set the stage for the consideration of another version of pay-as-you-go, which realizes reciprocity in the following sense, insofar as each generation both fully contributes to and receives from an ongoing pension scheme. And this is the arrangement I want to um, turn to for the remainder of today's talk. This particular type of pay-as-you-go arrangement involves the notional funding of all pensions promises, including those of the first generation of pensioners. It's not merely an interesting theoretical possibility, it's actually been realized in practice. I think that it's actually the way the Swedish state pension works, but I'm not entirely sure. Maybe others can, can shed light on that question. Um, since I think this idea of a notionally funded pay-as-you-go scheme has many virtues, I'm going to turn to a consideration of it now. So here's how a notionally funded pay-as-you-go system works. As in the case of funded defined benefit schemes, workers and employers put in pensions contributions each year in return for which they're promised a pension in retirement. The pensions of every member of this pay-as-you-go scheme, including those of the very first generation, are directly proportional to the level of their contributions throughout their working lives. And therefore, the first generation of pensioners does not ride free on the contributions of younger workers. And so the complaint I raised against pay-as-you-go state pensions a few moments ago 
doesn't apply here. And just as an aside, I'll note that notionally funded pay-as-you-go schemes don't get around the problem of backward induction that I also mentioned a few moments ago. If the first generation of pensioners pays a merely notional contribution, which is not invested in a ring fence for the last generation, as in this looping arrangement. But setting this particular problem aside of backward induction, let's assume that the scheme never closes or we don't know when it will close. These notional contributions will secure the reciprocity of everyone contributing who receives a pension, even if those contributions don't actually fund their own pensions. Now, uh, public sector pension schemes in the United Kingdom provide a good example of how such notional funding of a pay-as-you-go scheme works in practice. So the cost of the pensions that public sector workers in the UK are promised is covered by the contributions of employers and members, plus an assumed notional rate of return on these contributions. And this re assumed return also serves as the rate at which the pensions liabilities are discounted, the, the so-called discount rate. Now, as in the case of genuinely funded defined benefit pensions, the higher this assumed rate of return, the lower the contributions required to receive a pension of a given level. Here, however, the funding is merely notional rather than actual, since contributions are not placed into a fund which is genuinely invested in, that, in financial assets. Rather, they all, all, contributions all go into the coffers of the UK Treasury. So, how is this notional? rate of return set. It's set not as the expected rate of return R on the capital of some hypothetical portfolio of financial assets, but rather the notional rate of return is set as the expected long-term rate of growth G of the economy or GDP, gross domestic product. Now the rationale for setting the discount rate as G is that pay-as-you-go pensions are funded by tax revenues which grow roughly in line with the growth in the economy. And hence the hypothetical assets of the scheme are metaphorically conceived as claims on future tax revenue. And as the UK Treasury has explained in justifying this arrangement, he said, they say the government is not persuaded that a rate consistent with the private sector and other funded schemes would be an appropriate choice as the discount rate used to set unfunded pension scheme contributions. It, this former discount rate reflects the costs inherent in a scheme backed by a portfolio of assets, traded bonds and equities. And these are not held by the unfunded public service schemes whose assets are claims on future tax revenues, metaphorically speaking. Now, in setting the rate of return on pensions contributions as a rate at which tax revenues are expected to grow, the Treasury maintains that they thereby take into account the cost passed to future taxpayers on a fair and sustainable basis. So I think one of the themes is sustainability. So here's a link to sustainability. Now, there are some efficiency-based grounds for preferring a pay-as-you-go to a genuinely funded pension scheme. And some of these efficiency grounds involve such things as the low cost of administration, in contrast to the relatively high cost of good management of the assets portfolio of a funded pension scheme. Now, a case for a notionally funded pay-as-you-go pension scheme might be especially forthcoming when G is greater than R, where G represents a rate of per capita as opposed to aggregate growth of the economy. Now, in this case, it should be possible to provide better pensions for all by means of a notionally funded pay-as-you-go scheme in which pensions are paid out of tax revenues that increase at the rate of G as compared with a genuinely funded scheme whose assets grow at, in this hypothesis, the lower rate of return on capital R. Now, such a notionally funded pay-as-you-go pension scheme could be justified as to the reciprocal mutual advantage of each in comparison with a genuinely funded scheme. Now, if Thomas Piketty is right, however, that, it's an, that it was an aberration that G has been greater than R during the 20th century. And if he's right that R is greater than G for substantial periods uh, as a matter of um, sort of broader historical norm, then that would undermine such an efficiency-based case for pay-as-you-go over, uh, over the funded provision of pensions promises, at least during the next several decades.
I think it undermines but doesn't defeat the case for pay as you go, since as I hope to now show, a case for pay as you go can be made even when R is greater than G, which is to say even when the rate of return on capital exceeds the rate of growth of the economy. Now, to make this case, I shall begin by drawing attention to some striking parallels between a notionally funded pay as you go defined benefit scheme and a genuinely funded one which shed light on what a notionally funded pay-as-you-go pension actually consists of and when the case for it is compelling. Now, some people maintain that defined benefit schemes should purchase and hold long-dated inflation-linked government bonds so that the assets in which the scheme is invested match the liabilities of the pensions promises. Now, to these people, I would point out that the pensions contributions for a notionally funded pay-as-you-go scheme actually constitute the purchase of government bonds. And here's why. In exchange for employer and member pensions contributions that go into the Treasury's coffers, the government makes a promise to pay pensions. And such promises amount to illiquid, which is to say non-tradable government annuity bonds. Now, the yield of these annuity bonds is the discount rate G, which is a rate of return on one's contributions. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, for UK public sector schemes, this rate G, the discount rate is set as the long-term rate of growth of the economy, where the current forecast of G is a CPI plus 2.4. At least that's last I checked. It's probably lower now. Um, now, such annuity bonds have an attractive yield. I mean, maybe it's down to CPI plus two, but that's still an attractive yield relative to the yield of long dated inflation index linked bonds that the government issues, where the yield on um, index linked inflation index linked government bonds is now about 2% below CPI as opposed to the you know, two and a bit above CPI, that's the rate of return on one's notional contributions into a pay as you go scheme. Now, if these annuity bonds, which the government in fact issues um, to uh, public sector workers, were publicly tradable, Funded defined benefit pension schemes alone would create an enormous demand for these bonds. And therefore, pay as you go public sector schemes are, in effect, government fund, bond funded schemes, but with a much better yield of CPI plus two and a bit than that of the long dated index linked bonds, which some financial economists maintain should largely constitute the portfolios of privately funded defined benefit pension schemes. Now, a yield of CPI plus 2.4% is not as high as the expected long-term return on equities, which is now in the vicinity of something like CPI plus 4%. But unlike in the case of equity investment, there's no risk to the asset holder. The employers and members who pay the contributions in exchange for the government-issued annuities don't bear any investment risk. So question, should a pension scheme prefer to invest more cheaply in risky equities with a higher expected return or in the government annuity that I've been describing that has a rate of return pegged to the forecast growth of the economy. Now, rather than expose themselves to the downside risk of equities, I'm sure that many would leap at the chance to purchase liability matching assets with the government guaranteed return of something like CPI plus 2.4%. Now, issues of fairness might therefore be thought to arise on account of the fact that the government is issuing and exclusively selling annuity bonds at well below their fair market value to only some workers and employers, namely those who qualify for membership in public sector pensions. And the question arises, what grounds are there for the government to make these bonds available for purchase by those in the public sector, but not the private sector? And to overcome a charge of partiality and unfairness, I think if the government makes these available at all, they should make annuity bonds available to all employers and workers, including those in the private as well as the public sector. Now, here's a related question, which I'd now like to pose to those who call for private sector defined benefit pensions to be funded out of, out of a portfolio of long dated inflation index linked government bonds. The question is what explains your preference for funding such pensions at the lower discount rate of such government bonds? rather than the higher discount rate of, of the annuity bonds that the government makes available to public sector schemes. 
Is it because this reflects the value of the promises to workers and pensioners as reflected in their willingness to trade their promised pensions only for such liability matching government bonds? Now, this answer would, I think, make a mistake, which I discussed in earlier chapters of confusing the exchange value of a pension with the contributions required to secure it. In its rejection of the index linked bond yield as the discount rate for pay-as-you-go pensions, the Treasury notes that this option in effect answers a slightly different question from that of what the discount rate should be for setting the level of required contributions. Namely, that different question is, what would be the cost to an individual of buying a funded pension pot with the same characteristics as an unfunded public sector pension scheme? And it's just a fundamental mistake in uh, pension scheme valuation that's being pointed to. Now, might it be because the yield on long-dated um, index-linked bonds is set by the free market? But you say that's why we should use that yield, whereas the CPI plus 2.4% yield of annuity bonds is a product of an unfree market, given restrictions on who can purchase them and the inability to trade them. But I mean, I just note that, of course, the yield on long-dated index-linked bonds is not determined by a free market, given out how outsized a player the government is in, in this market under quantitative easing. I want to say is it's ultimately a matter of choice on the part of government, what sort of bonds to issue and to whom. Now, though this might have undesirable effects, which would tell against doing so, such as inflation or the crowding out of government borrowing for investment in infrastructure and the like, the government can choose to issue a CPI plus 2.4% annuity in greater volume and make them more widely available to workers and employers. And I want to just to, to wrap up now. Um, um, I know I'm going to go a bit, just, just, just a couple of minutes over time, but I want to now just step back and restate the case that I've been developing for collective pensions in the larger book of which this chapter is a part. Now, in an earlier chapter of this book, I showed how something called collective defined contribution converges on familiar defined benefit. Now, what I've tried to show in this presentation is how notionally funded pay-as-you-go public sector defined benefit pensions also converge on funded defined benefit pensions. So climbing the mountain from different sides, all these approaches converge on a similar form of collective pension provision, which breaks open the silos of individual defined contribution pension pots, while also avoiding the exorbitant expense of funding that's pegged to long dated index linked government bonds. So whether it ultimately takes a form of what's known as collective defined contribution, a genuinely funded defined benefit scheme or a notionally funded pay as you go defined benefit scheme, we've converged on the following, collective multi-generational society wide forms of pension provision. So I wanna wrap up by posing the following question. Why should those who are young, able-bodied, and productive pay for the pensions of those who are elderly, infirm, and out of work? Should they do so out of a duty to redistribute their known fortune to others who are known to be unfortunate in order to eliminate the unfairness of life? If this is the answer to the question I've just posed, then we'll have to rely on the capacity of the fortunate to identify with the fates of badly off strangers and altruistically agree to open their wallets to these strangers. And if the fortunate will not agree, then we'll need to find a Robin Hood who will rob from the rich against their wills to give to the poor. But I think we can, for the most part, conceive of the case for pensions differently as a form of reciprocity involving cooperation between persons, which is to the antecedent mutual advantage of each in terms of their prospects. We can conceive of the transfers of wealth of pension schemes, not as transfers between different people, but rather as transfers within the possible future lives of each individual, the transfers from one's more fortunate possible future selves to one's less fortunate possible future selves. So this case can be addressed along the following lines to those of you who've reached the age of majority and are near the beginnings of your adult lives. Many of you are young, able-bodied and productive, but barring miraculous breakthroughs in medical technology or discovery of a fountain of youth, you will not remain young and able-bodied forever. Some of you will tragically become seriously incapacitated during your working years as a result of illness 
or accident. For a few, the illnesses or accidents you suffer will be so serious that you will not survive into old age. The, the great majority of you, however, will make it into old age and reach a point when you're no longer able or willing to continue working. But you don't know how long you will live in retirement or how well any investment that you try to save up during the next generation, during the next several decades for your retirement will fare. Now, from the perspective of the beginning of your working lives, it's therefore rational for each of you to enter into an agreement with others who also don't yet know their fates, that if you turn out to be among the unfortunate whose pensions pots would not have yielded enough for your retirement, resources will be transferred to you from those whose pensions pots would have overflowed in retirement. But this arrangement will work only if we agree to bind ourselves in advance so that if we turn out to be among the fortunate, we're not allowed to defect from the scheme and go it alone. And it's rational for each of us to agree to share one another's fates by pooling risks across both space and time on fair terms of social cooperation for mutual advantage. Great. So that's, that's everything. Thank you so much, Mike. It's time for the uh, Q&A. And we have some uh, rules about that. So if you wish to ask a question and you're on online, you should write your question or your name rather in the chat. And it's also useful if you can add your discipline so we can keep track on making sure we have a sort of uh, various variety of disciplines uh, represented us in the questions. And also we have the uh, uh, follow-up uh, mechanism here so you can also ask a follow-up question but then it's important that you mention the name of the person you're following up to right so following up to Tim for instance so we can keep track on the follow-up questions um, other than that when you are online and you it's your turn you will be put in the spotlight so to speak and you will ask your questions and then we're going to have a mix between questions from online and questions from the from the room so Okay, so we can start with the question from the online community here, uh, Dan Hausman. Um, Mike, that was a, a wonderful paper. Um, I'm curious, uh, do you know the, Sam the Samuelson paper on uh, overlapping generations and, its, uh, and the commentary on this? This was from... I guess 1958, I think, was the original paper, and there were comments in 59 and, and 60. Because uh, what he points out there is, uh, again, I don't think this would be practical, but I think it's another way of uh, illustrating the points that you're making, is that one could uh, set up a, a system whereby one receives pension payments only if you have certain certificates. And you have to buy those certificates as you're working. Uh, and so uh, and there's an individual incentive to do that because there's otherwise you receive nothing in your in your in your retirement. It has the problem of unraveling with a known final uh, known final date. But again, it's uh, a way that one could see this as becoming uh, to use the game theory terminology. Uh, uh, it would be a way to, uh, in principle, have a, a Nash equilibrium whereby people would be supporting the elderly in exchange for getting support later, but not because they would see that as doing that, but rather be, because they would be uh, investing now in these certificates, which would provide for them uh, when they were retirees. So th I'm, I'm not actually familiar with that particular piece by Samuelson, but how how is this different from ordinary sort of investment of one's pensions pot and then purchasing an annuity? Could you just elaborate a bit on this? Uh, well, the idea is that this is a uh, uh, a state run system. It's not it's not purchasing annuity in the original Samuelson model. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, to simplify it, you, just, uh, you could have uh, just uh, uh, two generations, 
producers and uh, retirees, and nothing nothing can be saved. So that the the only way that retirees can get anything is if producers provide it. And why are they going to provide it? Well, if you have a fiat money system running there, the retirees will purchase from the uh, pr producers uh, what they need. The producers will, of course, accept the fiat money because otherwise, you know, and reduce their consumption because otherwise they'll have nothing when they are retirees themselves. And so you have a, uh, it's a way of, uh, you know, clearly the, this isn't practical. This is very, very theoretical. But clearly it's a way of realizing uh, a sort of Nash equilibrium here. Okay, right. Interesting. So I wonder how this differs from the Binmore case. Um, so, so we can. So money is essentially an IOU, especially fiat right. money, right? So, um, in the Binmore case, there isn't a promise, but there's just a norm, which is a Nash equilibrium, where cooperators, um, where, where people punish people if, if and only if they haven't cooperated. Okay, so, so here, I'm but, just trying to think. But in this case, you don't require any, so you could do this with social norms, but you don't require any social norms. The issue is each individual well, pro producer has a choice of either consuming or accepting fiat money from the re 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 uh, re retirees. And if they don't accept the re fiat money from retirees, they don't get anything when they're uh, re retired. Ah, right, okay. So, so you could think of that as the norm that, that's a Nash equilibrium and a bit like the way that bread is sort of um, tr transferring bread in retirement, not, not consuming all the bread in your working life, but right. um, transferring to the, yeah. So yeah. Uh, um, right. So I wonder, I suppose that maybe the advantage of bin more is that um, we don't have to then explain the further complexity of how it is that, um, these IOUs manage to have um, binding force, right? That might be a particular problem. I mean, I mean, typically, um, well, you know, one explanation for money in the form of IOUs having force is that it's ultimately that which you can redeem um, in order to avoid punishment or having to pay um, a legal fine. Um, sorry, can you, are, are you having trouble hearing? Sorry. Uh, hey, we okay, can hear you. Okay. I've quieted my dog. I apologize. Uh, uh, oh, right. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, I was wondering whether I had cut out, but, but, but evidently not. So, um, um, so there's this issue of, um, how you can explain fiat money. Um, the, the one explanation would have to, um, tie it to the course of power of the state to tax and to fine. Um, but I'm assuming in this example, we're not involving that. Um, and then I suppose it's the, re the reliability, when you transfer an IOU that was issued by someone, the reliability of the original person who transferred the IOU. And so I'm thinking that maybe the, the Samuelson account raises, for, essentially sounds like it might essentially re reduce to something like the Binmore account, but with further things that need explained. At least that's my hunch. Not having um, th uh, c encountered the Samuelson uh, suggestion before. Uh, I, uh, we, we shouldn't pro pro prolong this any further. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's quite nifty and the, the debate that followed it, I think is, is uh, immediately relevant to uh, what you're doing. Right, thanks. Good. Right, the next one on the list is now Gustav. Hi, Mike. Uh, great to see this uh, so well developed. I think I heard the first version of this quite a number of years ago at the Institute when you started working on this. Uh, right, yeah. Here's a question that might be me just being confused or not listening carefully enough. You, you were so kind of referring to one of my very old papers where I express a lot of skepticism about uh, heat and binmore and the whole idea that we can justify this through some kind of idea of 
mutual advantage uh, over generation in some kind of overlapping game. Now, I wasn't clear whether you agreed that, uh, with my criticism or if you just thought it was, yeah, that's, uh, you know, a criticism that's only relevant if you look at it in some very idealis idealized way. But, but let me remind me, the criticism that you brought up was just one of my criticism. The problem is that if you, given all this idealist s assumption, if you should believe there is a norm that is, is in a Nash equilibrium, <laughs> These agents have to believe that this game goes on indefinitely, or at least some high probability about that. They don't know when it's going to end. And and given that the sun is going to blow up or something like that, it seems a, a strange assumption to do. And then you get this problem with backward induction. But I also had another argument. And the problem with few generations when you have a repeated game is that we can actually affect the baseline. What you get uh, uh, when uh, there is no cooperation, but what you get in state of nature. So, in one way, with that model of heat, uh, you can actually get people to cooperate, even if they get very much less than seem to be fair. And then a third point is, of course, you will have several. You might also have several uh, equilibriums, and you need some principle for choosing between the different equilibriums. But maybe you agree with all this, but I, I wasn't sure, since you ended with a picture of Leviathan and some idea of, of mutual advantage. Right, so um, um, the second point you made, I'm, I'm getting an echo, but it sounded a bit like, um, I mean, so in the, in, in the Binmore setup, there are two Nash equilibria, right? One, one of which is much less good than the other one. Um, and um, it, it would, you know, it, it would be to everyone's mutual advantage to, cons to, to consume both lobes given what everyone else is doing. Um, and then the question is how we get to this better Nash equilibrium. Um, and I, I suppose Binmore thinks that if, if, if one just, yeah, I guess I, it's not entirely clear how it is that this you know, we, we get to this better Nash equilibrium. That's that's something a bit of a mystery in the in the Binmore account, and perhaps more generally. Did you want to jump in, Gustav? Yeah, yeah, I think it is a mystery. I mean, also to solve that, one usually appeals to some other normative principle, but then it's unclear why not appeal to that principle directly. What work is this kind of apparatus of the repeated game actually doing? Yeah, no, I think that that is a good point. Um, I think the only work it does is shows how we we can um, actually sustain this mutually beneficial practice in, in the absence of coercion and po possibly it might be useful in illuminating why in, in illuminating why it is that we um, don't stop um, paying taxes for the pensions of our elders so that was you know what, what I took to be perhaps a real world collective example of um, the sort of norm, uh, mutually advantageous norm being in Nash equilibrium. But of course, you need to have set up this social security system in the first place, right? With coercive taxation and the like um, in order to get this practice going. And I suppose that, you know, the, the, the Binmore story didn't actually explain how it is that the practice got going in this, in this simpler case. So maybe that's sort of along the lines of the second point you were making. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now this so I think uh, also if I remember, it was a long time since I read it, but Heath's paper, he appeals to some some principles of fairness and justice, but then you wonder why you can't appeal to them directly. He just appeals to them to kind of choose the better equilibrium. And you wonder, okay, if you were appealing to that, why not appeal to them even earlier on? And you skip the whole uh, kind of uh, repeated game and neutral advantage talk. Right, yeah. So it might just be a matter of... Um um, how to explain the um, fact that the system is sustained in the absence of um, um, enforcement, though I suppose you, you could say it's instead sustained by people's conforming to um, uh, these uh, principles of fairness and justice, which you might think of as, 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 as less um, reliable if you're a cynical economist, I suppose. Um, now as, for, as far as um, the first point regarding backward induction. Um, I think I agree that that, that that does seem to be a problem, at least if you know when the end will be, right? If you don't know when the end will be, then it's not a problem. 
Um, it, it, um, and if you do know when they, I mean, at least the, the sort of the looping um, solution, I think, um, addresses backward induction, although it's it's itself something which is impractical. But but I, I assume that the fact that you you don't know when it will end also um, explains why the problem doesn't get going. But it sounded like you might want to respond to that. Yeah, it's a it's a little bit tricky actually because if you know that it's going to end even though you don't know exactly what going you know that there's some last generation and you know they are going to defect, then you can start to unravel it in, anyway. So so uh, it, it's not in some other repeated games that works, but I don't think it works in this one because you know there is going to be an end and the last generation will then have all reasons to defect and they will. And then you think oh, at some point that will happen. But I mean, there's another problem. All of this is, of course, extremely idealized assumption about uh, our rationality and uh, and the knowledge. I, I'm not. I'm kind of reluctant to to rely on, on on the whole setup, so to say. So you could reply, yeah, yeah, that's only for hyper rational people, but people are not that rational. So maybe we can fool them to say that this goes on, and we are not that rational. But then we are not really in the game of, of uh, doing a real Nash equilibrium. There's something else we're doing. Right. I, I, I don't know if that was clear enough. Yeah, uh, some sort of no, yeah. no, noble lie to keep the scheme going. <laughs> I'm not sure. or, or just relying on people's irrationality, which yeah. they haven't. I, I shouldn't hog the time here, but what do you think about the problem that with few generations, we can also affect what they get in the baseline, what they get uh, when there is no cooperation. So we can actually make it worse for them if they don't cooperate and therefore give them much less when they do cooperate. They will still have a prudential reason to cooperate. So okay, that's so, a difference from, from the present generation where the baseline is already set. But for future people, we can actually see too that uh, what you don't get if you don't cooperate is much lower. Interesting. That's another point um, I had in that old paper. Right. Um, the, the, the present generation can ensure that things are really bad for the future generation and then that there's just a slight improvement over that. Um, now, I, I suppose that that might be more relevant to something like the just savings principle than pensions provision because pensions provision is going backwards, whereas the just savings principle is going saving for the next generation, you know, whereas pensions provision is giving to the past generation. So that, 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 thinks that might actually explain why it's not a problem for pensions, whereas it is a problem for the just savings principle, but that's just a hunch. We should let other people ask questions too, so, but very interesting. Let's talk more. Right. Right. Okay, and the next one on the list is Larry Temkin. Great. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, I guess you are muted. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, so first of all, greetings to all my friends in uh, Sweden, and uh, and Julia, this is for you. Um, so thanks very much, Mike, for that talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I, I have a small response to Gustav, just comment about Gustav, and then I want to ask my main question. Uh, it there's a distinction, of course, between knowing that there will be a last generation. We might be confident about that, and our knowing when we are a member of the last generation. And those are two separate things. And we may not know the second, even if we know the former. And that's really important how we think about these things. So, I, but that's not my question. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, so my question, Mike, really is, it seems to me that it's very easy in talking about these kinds of issues, and you're much more knowledgeable about them than I am, to blur, blur different kinds of considerations. Um, so, um, so one of the questions is, what's the point of the system that we're talking about? I mean, and are we focusing on a particular system and for what reason? So you're, you're talking about pension schemes. Um, but, but when we think about pension schemes, we think about pension schemes as, you know, a form of savings or pay as you go for workers, people who have worked, how much they contribute, how long have they contributed? These are pension schemes. But sometimes we want our pension schemes to do a lot of different things. So sometimes what we conflate is the issue of what's a pension scheme and its justification from what's an insurance scheme and its justification 
or from what's a welfare scheme and its justification, or for what are desirable ideals that we might want promoted. And then we tend to focus on things like equality or, or priority, you know, people who are really badly off in their old age, we want to protect against that. But there are lots of ideals that one might care about. Uh, you could care about uh, perfectionism. You could care about just efficiency or utility or uh, autonomy. And these and all would offer different kinds of support for different kinds of things. And my, my concern, and it's not, it's not an objection to anything you said, um, but as I listened to what you said, and you were looking for possible kinds of explanations for why you might or might not want something in your pension scheme, I wasn't sure if we weren't conflating the different things that we want. And maybe it would be useful to separate these. What do you want from a, a kind of scheme that workers are involved in whether reciprocal or not, how we want to do it, pay as you go, that will amount to a way of savings or the equivalent of a savings because they converge versus what do we want to protect us against, you know, things going really bad versus what do we want to go protect us if, if uh, you know, the economy goes kaput versus blah, 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 blah. And it just seems to be these are different possible points or different possible aims, and we might be better served to keep them really separate. And we might say, we want one thing for our pension scheme to do, and then we want a welfare program, a social welfare program, and they're just for different reasons. And we shouldn't think that we want our pension scheme to do what we want our social welfare scheme to do. And I wasn't sure that either by you or by others who think about these issues, that these different possible goals or aims are always kept separate. Thanks. So one thing I mentioned is um, that so, so I, I talk about you know, two different justifications, and you're right that there are many more than these two, but the, the two sort of justifications which I used to frame this were something like Rawlsian reciprocity, and um, I suppose you could call it a Tempkinian like egalitarianism. Um, so so um, um, protecting against brute bad luck, and of course someone like Dworkin sort of blurs the distinction but, but by appealing to hypothetical insurance. Um, um, but um, the, sort of, you know, protecting against bad brute luck, um, in which case, uh, you know, lots of pension schemes wouldn't really make sense. And um, the, the sort of insurance element might not take the form uh, of the sort of occupational pension scheme that I was discussing, but it would be, you know, something much more like the um, so-called beverage system of a state pension scheme where, uh, basically, uh, you, we, we all ensure that we have enough in our retirement so that we're out of poverty. Um, now, th then with that, you might wonder why should that have anything to do with um, your own um, contributions uh, or the income you earned during your working life, right? And in fact, um, as I briefly mentioned, there are some state pension schemes that don't involve basically something like a social security tax or a national insurance tax. Um, they just involve residents. And then there's this interesting example, you know, I mentioned the Netherlands, where most of them it's like, okay, you have to be resident for a certain number of years, and then you're counted as a permanent resident entitled to these benefits. We don't want, you know, someone to be able to be entitled immediately, but if they're settled, then they're entitled. But in the Netherlands, it's... Um, you know, based on the number of years you've been a resident as opposed to the number of years you've been paying in. And, and, and maybe the reason why it's so un unique is because it doesn't really make sense of, you know, of, of any of these sort of different justifications. I mean, the one justification is just um, luck egalitarian, but restricted to one's own um, um, uh sort of population, and of course we have to explain why they're so restricted, but that tends to be the restriction to one's own population, in which case um, the mere fact that you're settled should be sufficient and it doesn't matter how many years you're a resident, as opposed to something else which is more um, sort of a matter of reciprocity, um, sort of you know, fair terms of social cooperation for mutual advantage, as, as you know, Rawls puts it. And, and there it seems um, that mere numbers of years of residence wouldn't constitute terms of cooperation. Um, but 
you know, the number of years that you worked and perhaps the amount that you've um, earned might count as, you know, among the terms of cooperation. And then, and then another way of looking at what's going on with occupational pension schemes is actually, you know, people taking sort of their property and finding ways to pool their property in a manner that's mutually advantageous. Where here, it really makes a big difference, you know, how much you're earning because, you know, a certain percent of what you're earning is actually put into this pension fund. And then what we have is um, sort of risk pooling of that fund where it's sort of, I suppose, mutual advantage um, in um, just in the sense of people being able to do things that um, people being able to, to, to through cooperation, uh, reach um, uh, an outcome which is, which is better than each could achieve on their own and where it's to their mutual advantage against that baseline. So I think, I guess I'm, ag I'm agreeing with you that um, uh, uh, the, I, I had put things pretty simply in terms of sort of Robin Hood and social insurance, but there are lots of other com complexities. And I, I'll just say that I, I suppose um, it was um, through my, um, all this work I've been doing on pensions in the UK um, I, I just been involved with negotiations over the UK pension scheme recently. Um, it was really actually when I first became familiar with the way the pension scheme worked in the UK that I finally actually saw the point of, 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 of Rawlsianism, this idea of fair terms of social cooperation for mutual advantage. And before it was very much a sort of, you know, Temkin, Dworkin, Cohen sort of luck egalitarian framework. And I always rebelled against sort of roles as, you know, as, as not quite getting the point. But it was really finally when I, when I saw what was going on with the pension scheme and how it's something other than, you know, realizing luck egalitarianism, um, that, that, that I did see the point of, of Rawlsianism. And, and now I think I'm sort of, you know, a, a more of a Rawlsian social democrat than a luck egalitarian. I'll, ju I'll just sort of end on that sentence, autobiographical note. Can I a quick follow up? And, yep, yep. And only because you said we have plenty of time for questions, I don't see a long queue. So, just suppose we lived in a society where people were convinced by Philippe's book or other people since him that we should all have a basic income. So, we all have a basic income and we also have universal health care. So, we're protecting against, you know, people could still make choices for themselves of what kind of life they're going to leave no matter lead them, no matter how long they're going to live, and if they get really sick, they're protected. Now, the question then still arises, should we have pension plans, right? Should companies have pension plans? Should countries have pension plans? And what would those look like if we already were separately, you know, taking out the issue of, you know, you don't have to worry about your health, that's going to be taken care of, and you'll have a basic income, that's going to be taken care of. Now, what would our pension plans look like? And I wonder if they would look different. Right. So, um, sorry, sorry, did I cut you off? No. Um, right. So, so, um, yeah. So, suppose that um, the, the, the basic income is constituted by I don't know, equal claims on natural worldly resources. Um, so I, I suppose in, in the absence of such, such claims, then. I have sort of Rawlsian reservations about unconditional basic income. It does seem of like a form of a free riding off of the efforts of others, but, but I can see a justification involving, you know, our, our equal claims to unowned worldly resources. Um, now, and, and I think we do actually have such um, claims um, and, and that, you know, that, that baseline is very important for setting um, the, the, the terms um, under which pension schemes are fair. And if obviously if the terms are much less egalitarian, then mutually advantageous arrangements will be possible, which will be deemed um, exploitative even to the mutual advantage of each. So, so I think that this baseline of um, sort of something like an unconditional basic income, but you know, with the sort of justification I can accept, um, would in fact make a big difference to what sorts of um, 
mutually advantageous forms of risk pooling of people's assets would be justified. And I think there would still be a role, um, even if we each have, so to speak, our, our I, I suppose uh, the um, what, what this is generally called is um, not a basic income, but I suppose um, a, a, a basic asset um, entitlement, um, th then th that still leaves open the problem that we need to um, find ways of if if we want to you know rise above that level um managing risk and i suppose investment risk is is the biggest risk and so there'll still be lots of scope for things like occupational pension schemes where you know what's what what's unique about them is we we want to find ways of making sure that w what we earn will you know supplement whatever the basic income gives us in retirement so that we have a reasonably good retirement um i suppose this is maybe a particularly pressing issue for for you larry i mean having just entered or about to enter into retirement although, although um hopefully you're in the um, um defined benefit rutgers pension scheme which is actually fantastic but i think a lot of americans are are, are um unaware of the of, of the merits of the Defined benefit Rutgers pension scheme, but um, um, the, you know the, there is this big issue that we all have to confront, which is how to make sure we have enough to have a comfortable retirement. And and there the biggest problem is is how to deal with investment risk if you're doing it on your own with your 401k. And so even if we do have this um, unconditional basic income, there would still be uh, this live question about you know how we save enough during our working lives efficiently enough in a way which deals with investment risk. Um, and, and I think so, so European approaches involving risk pooling are actually much better than, you know, the, the, the American approach, which um, has us investing into individual pension pots or 401ks. But sort of interestingly, though, the, the U.S. state pension, Social Security, is actually quite generous by sort of world standards, but something that one wouldn't expect from the United States. But there is this actually pretty solid baseline, which is um, paid out of taxation for, for Americans. Okay, uh, next on the list uh, we have here in the room, Malcolm, you need the microphone. Hi. Um, I'm a sociologist, not a philosopher, so um, forgive me if my question uh, maybe doesn't make sense or comes from left field. Uh, but let me first say that uh, I wasn't sure at the beginning of your talk if I would be able to follow that much, but I was, and I really appreciated that and got a lot out of it. Um, in fact, there were elements of it that, that sort of engaged with stuff that I do in intriguing ways, and that's what I sort of wanted to ask you about. So um, as I um, briefly talked earlier today to this group about, uh, I do a lot of research on issues of trust. And, you know, we could look at lots of different environmental problems as collective action problems where uh, people have a tendency to defect, but they might be able to cooperate. And basically all kinds of social science investigates ways in which trust in each other or trust in coordinating institutions conditions the likelihood of people uh, cooperating rather than defecting. And so I was sort of intrigued by elements of your presentation that touched on these sorts of collective action dilemmas, but I don't think I ever once heard you use the word trust anywhere in your presentation. And yet when you talk about, for example, the I think the person you mentioned was Joseph Heath, was talking about expectations a lot. Well, expectations about you know somebody else doing something that have consequences for the choice you make yourself about what you're going to do sounds a lot like trust. And so there is some social science literature that deals, including with pensions and issues of confidence in institutions and how they will potentially yield benefits you know, in the far future that might condition, for example, all kinds of political choices or public attitudes about political choices 
um, of, of quite substantial you know, consequence, including with respect to climate change. So I guess my question for you is, how do you see uncertainty about other people's behavior operating in your sort of arguments or conclusions? Because in some ways, I wasn't totally sure if you were saying, you know, that you're doing normative work and you're just not necessarily going to worry about people's you know, potential uncertainty or lack of trust, or if in a sense you were dealing squarely with the issue of trust and trying to grapple with how to think about a whole set of systems and institutions that are fundamentally in a sense concerned with this issue of, of how we trust the generation that comes after us to take care of ourselves in the way that the previous generation, you know, et cetera. Um, and so I was wondering if you could say something about you know, is there a place for trust in any of this or, or sort of uncertainty? And if so, what it is? Oh, thanks. So, so I've been magically unmuted. Um, so, um, right. So thanks for that question. So, um, so I tend to approach things normatively, but in appealing to this notion of reciprocity, I then ended up um, discussing game theoretic literature, which is not obviously normative. Um, so then, so there was this shift from, I mean, talking about um, sort of reciprocity in Rawls's sense, which seems to be uh, quite a, a, a normative principle, fair terms of social cooperation for mutual advantage. And, and then when I asked, well, how might we extend Rawlsian reciprocity to this sort of unidirectional you know, a uh, case of either saving for the next generation um, uh, or else uh, giving uh, some of one's income to the past generation where there isn't a sort of a, a, a bilateral exchange. Um, and I, I was thinking there that uh, we ought to see, especially in the case of um, um, the sort of large sort of anonymous institutions like pension schemes as something I was saying about Joseph Heath, that we need to see how these things can be sustained. Um, and I, I was probably thinking that we didn't, didn't want to rely too much on trust for these large scale sort of fairly anonymous schemes. And I was thinking in the first instance that we would need enforceability um, but that may be something other than enforceability, but rather um, social norms of the sort that Binmore refers to would actually make sense of um, how we sustain these institutions at a collective level. Um, I think I was I was hoping that um, we wouldn't have to rely on trust there. And um, Heath says, it isn't actually a matter of trust. That's not why we um, give to pension schemes, um, but it's for another reason, um, which has to do with um, something like Ken Binmore's story of how these norms perpetuate themselves. Uh, but I think that the one case in which um, things might break down at the um, collective level is if we just really have very little confidence that the next generation will actually contribute to us in our own retirement for whatever reason. Maybe we think they won't be able to contribute because of um, issues having to do with environmental or financial sustainability. Um, or it might have to do with um, not being able to trust the institutions because of matters of corruption. I think if, 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 if those were present, then this um, account couldn't get off the ground. So, so I guess I'm thinking that um, one has to think that um, that which would lead one to distrust the institution is, is, is absent for, for this account to get off the ground. And I guess in that respect, I think trust is relevant. I'm not sure whether it's relevant and at least I, just off the top of my head, how it might otherwise figure in this account.
Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much for a very interesting talk and a very good discussion. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Just going to mention some upcoming uh, seminars here, uh, the, the research seminar at IF. So March the 16th, Team Bartley, Perceptions of Distance Problem, Popular Understandings of Labor and Environmental Problems in Global Supply Chains. Uh, March 23rd, Jan Theorel, Commitments and Bargaining Delays in Parliamentary Democracies. And finally, March 30th, Maria Oyala, Hope in the Face of Climate Change, Wishful Thinking or an Existential Must. Thank you for participating.